Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And okay, let's try something new. In this video, we're going to be going back to what critics considered the best albums of 2013, and I'm going to be delivering some choice comments on all of them. I'm going to be working off my own personal year-end list from 2013, as well as include some honorable mention selections from what other people put on a pedestal for better and for worse. Now, none of you should take this all that seriously. They're albums from a solid decade ago, the majority of which I still like. It's intended for some good fun. And while some artists have certainly taken a nosedive in the public eye over the past decade, for God's sake, this is not an invitation to go harass musicians who have come out of a rough couple of years. If you do that, you're among the biggest mouth-breathing losers of them all. So with that in mind, Mind. Honorable mention, Arcade Fire, Reflector. After winning a Grammy for The Suburbs and infuriating Eminem for beating Recovery, hey look, the Grammys got it right for once, Arcade Fire came back and went directly up their own asses. I feel a little bit vindicated by saying that Reflector was always pretentious and mediocre at best with their warped and bloated attempt at interpolating Black Orpheus that went all sorts of questionable places. I mean, you would think these white Canadians from Montreal, including famous woman respecter Wynne Butler would know better, but I don't know, in between this and Hades Town, the myth of Orpheus just did things to the indie set in the early 2010s, all the more obnoxious when you realize that they are now using it for a lot of navel-gazing on the nature of fame, and nobody, including the audience, did their readings. Now, this would naturally be extended onto Everything Now, where everything represents a lot of critics collectively realizing that this band was turning to absolute crap. Let's move on. Honorable mention, Beyonce, Beyonce. All right, we've already started off contentious. Why not follow with the album that most of the Beehive considers her best, forgetting that four already exist? Now, while this has grown on me over the years, it's still a meandering slog where if you're not into Beyonce having rough sex over some truly obnoxious sense and crushing bass, you might wind up feeling left out. Now, to Beyonce's credit, outside of her falsetto, she kind of owns this album, and thus every man on it humiliates himself. Drake, as a expected, but the true low point was Jay-Z on Drunken Love, where he compared his relationship with his wife to Ike and Tina Turner. Certainly a choice on an album that wants to emblazon girl boss feminism on everything. I feel like the feminist agenda may have translated better when Beyonce's sister Solange kicked Jay-Z in the elevator. Hell, after Magna Carta Holy Grail, I can't even blame her. Honorable mention, Chance the Rapper, Acid Rap. In retrospect, it might have been better for Chance to be a flash in the pan, playful, naturally charismatic rapper with flows that tumbled everywhere and got past a lot of rough edges consistently in the production thanks to his heart really being in the right place. He would later go on to showcase a lot of thin-skinned religious conservatism that would culminate with The Big Day, which many have considered one of the worst albums of the 2010s and that I unironically like. Funny, the acid got neutralized by being basic. Honorable mention, Death Heaven, Sunbather. Okay, only a complete loser would come up here and say that this band has always been full of complete posers looking to commodify black metal for the rock festival set and Apple commercials. Those true cult jagoffs who need to get out of the basement and put their Warhammer 40k figurines away. Anyway, these complete posers made one album this year that was somewhat tolerable among black gays, a genre that has existed since the late 90s, but a bunch of preening douchebags want to say that this band invented. Def Heaven would then go on to prove everyone right in the worst way possible by releasing two albums that most in the metal scene have already forgotten exist, and then just start making bland shoegaze. Somebody free their drummer from this hell. Honorable mention, Disclosure with Settle. Ah, yes. The EDM record for the Molly crowd who thought they were too smart and sophisticated for Calvin Harris and David Guetta. It's also something that Disclosure would never match because Caracol was mediocre and Energy was five years too late for anyone to really care, a dance album released in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it's distinctly sad that the majority of people probably remember this group for launching the career 
of Sam Smith. Honorable mention, Drake, nothing was the same. Okay, the follow-up to Take Care, that a certain annoyingly loud minority of fans will claim is the best album that Drake actually made. As a member of this group obliged to roast this, it is a project that planted all the seeds as to why so many of us are thoroughly sick of Drake by now. From the meandering pace, to the appropriations of other rap styles with very mixed success, to Wu-Tang Forever that has absolutely nothing to do with the Wu-Tang Clan, to Pound Cake, which might have one of Jay-Z's worst verses this year, to then Jhenei Aiko stealing the entire album with From Time, to Started From The Bottom, which many critics called one of the best rap songs of 2013, despite being a boring, painfully weak, obnoxious slog. I mean, Drake was right that nothing was ever quite the same after this. The question is whether or not that was a good thing. Honorable mention, Fallout Boy, Save Rock and Roll. The comeback album for an astoundingly pissy band who figured out after sitting out the club boom with failed side projects and a conceptual project that underperformed, the best way to succeed was to insult you, the audience, at length. It winds up being a frankly ridiculous album with even sillier music videos made for every single song released out of order with the songs on the album because Arrested Development's fourth season in 2013 apparently convinced people that coherent continuity is for little bitches. But you know, it did produce the commercial revival of Fall Out Boy. Yeah, they'd probably squander that too. Honorable mention, Jason Isbell with South Eastern. The album that, for some very stupid reason, never made my list originally is one of the best of 2013, and also an extremely difficult one to roast as it features a lot of heartfelt, minimalist moments exploring living with alcoholism, cancer, and abuse. Well, at least in a few years we get 30 to 50 wild hogs, but uh, let's be real. If you remember that, you also probably know that more people probably recognize Morgan Wallen's cover of Cover Me Up than the original here. Yikes. Honorable mention, Justin Timberlake with the 2020 Experience. Ah yes, an album so bloated and swollen with opulent, overmanaged production and undeserved ego that Justin Timberlake delivered a second helping this same year that nobody wanted and everyone seems to want to forget. This is the I'm back bitch duology riding on so much arrogance that it made a couple people snap awake and realize that Justin Timberlake's preening excess and truly disgusting sex references, they had a limit? He would then follow this with an album and a Super Bowl performance that will probably wind up on train records in the near future, and then promptly ended his musical career, at least for now. You could have argued that it should have happened with part two of two. We could have been spared so much. Honorable mention, Kanye West, Yeezus. You know, for an album that so brazenly rips off Death Grips to only epically miss the point, where the fundamental appeal is the transgressive reassertion of the ugliness of ego and everything he then says about women, alongside a song literally titled Black Skinhead, maybe everyone should have seen this past year coming. All I need to say. Honorable mention, Lady Gaga with Art Pop. Probably not a good sign that the most folks remember from your layered, self-referential pop artistry is a song glorifying applause in your direction and the R. Kelly guest appearance. I mean, if Lady Gaga thinks she pulls her creativity from her vagina, this is lodged firmly in her ass. Word of the wise, very different holes. Honorable mention, Lord with Pure Heroin. Ah, the album that so many proclaimed would change everything in pop. And it certainly did. The sound got commodified, driven into the ground, and made so much of mid-2010s pop a tuneless percussion over melody bore. Lord would thankfully go on to do more over this lightly overrated and over-discoursed album, and then receive no proper attention for melodrama and negative attention for solo power, where she got sick of your projections and bullshit, and the irony poison generation got really damn mad when they apparently didn't get that the joke was on them. Although the album beating mediocre probably did not help. Honorable mention, The Knife Shaking the Habitual. This album contains a nearly 10 minute piece where it sounds like someone is gagging on sloshing oil in order to make a point about fracking. This was the level highly acclaimed political discourse was on in 2013. It's just very telling how without any real controversy, a lot of critics have been kind of reticent to give this a lot of praise the past 10 years. I mean, what can I say? You ditch populism for your politics, you often wind up sounding pretentious. 
I should know. Honorable mention from Tim Hecker, Virgins. Very rare that an album title can so aptly summarize its listening audience. As a member of this audience who actually has had sex, Rave Death 1972 is better. And finally, honorable mention, 21 Pilots, Vessel. I gave this a high score and called it a great album two years before anyone in the mainstream even cared, and this insufferable fanbase lost their shit because I highlighted how a genre-bending, heavily emo-inspired band made just that, on an album that probably could have used several better producers. I mean, stan culture was not thrown around enough to describe the clique, but after they threw colossal hissy fits when Top made their two best albums with Blurry Face and Scaled and Icy, and then refused to admit when the duo called them out directly on multiple singles and albums, I think I'm inclined to be less generous. Now granted, I don't know how many of the clique are actually left. If Tyler Joseph on social media didn't drive you away, Scaled and Icy certainly did. But frankly, I'm tired of the migraine. And now onto the list proper. The albums I placed as my top 25 of this year in order from the Flower Kings, Desolation Rose. Let's be real, not even the diehard prog fans remember or care about this album. The darker, heavier pivot that basically reminded all of us that Paradox Hotel really does deserve another listen. Although, apparently they put out three albums since and they've actually sold better and are well reviewed. I think the joke might be on me here. From Vampire Weekend, Modern Vampire of the city. Whereas this band put out one thoroughly mediocre album six years after this and have done nothing ever since. In any case, this was their best album, following off of their worst. Contra certainly earns being named after fashy Central American terrorists funded by the Reagan administration. Not sure the irony holds up there, boys. But even despite some good appropriated grooves, the reality is quite clear. If your music is lightweight enough to appease the cardigan American prep school lot who unironically wear fluorescent shorts, boat shoes, and will wind up working at their daddy's law firm by empathizing so much with acclaimed woman respecter Ezra Koenig, you know some gently nihilistic satire of that scene and God, I don't think they're the words against power that you think think they are. From Alan Jackson, the Bluegrass album. Okay, I'm a little bit cautious to dump on Alan Jackson, a neo-traditional staple of my childhood, and is actually currently suffering a debilitating neurological condition of which there's no real cure. So instead, I'm going to lightly rib on the fact that despite being called the Bluegrass album, with one of the two stylistic variations that Jackson has had in his 30 plus years of albums, the best song here is Blue Ridge Mountain Song, pretty much just a country track. Bit of a half measure there. Still, hope you get well, Alan. Looking forward to more. From LMNO and Evidence, After the Fact. You know, it turns out after releasing 10 albums in one year, seriously, LMNO did it in 2010. It was approaching King Gizzard levels of oversaturation. This chronically underrated West Coast MC decided to team up After the Fact, fellow white monotone rapper Evidence, for a great album targeted at the bearded, backpack-wearing hipsters of the world who will inevitably pontificate about conspiracy theories and veganism before asking you for money for weed. I mean, the album's title's kind of apt because nobody was seriously listening to those guys in 2013, even if they kind of wound up being right about this and precious little else. From Pearl Jam, Lightning Bolt. Oh look, Pearl Jam makes a big, splashy, fun, hard rock record that, as expected, alienates a significant chunk of their diehard fan base. And now, since Pearl Jam effectively does this with every record, you're immediately branded a commercial casual if you had any fun with this whatsoever, which is kind of ironic because it actually underperformed. Pearl Jam would then take seven years off to put out the slightly more experimental Gigaton, which, you know what, come to think of it, didn't get much warmer of a reception. I mean, I just really wanted lightning to strike twice. The problem might be you guys. From Dessa, Parts of Speech. Hey look, one of my top five rappers decided to do a lot less rapping and go into indie pop and R&B. And the album winds up brilliant, but very much transitional, and slept on pretty much by everyone who preferred a badly broken code and chime instead. Look, this is an album for those whose graduate degrees are not keeping them warm, or those who espouse leftist politics while being able to afford property. I mean, you really gotta appreciate the diversity of thought here. From Vienna Tang, AIM. 
Williams. This is, unironically, a fantastic synth-pop pivot from her adorably adult alternative that would serve really well as the corporate retreat music for all the businesses that Vienna Tang passionately dislikes as an environmental activist now. So naturally, we haven't gotten any albums since. She does seem to be on the cusp of releasing a few more. I hope she's able to get out of her own head and around to our pending possible extinction so we can actually, you know, hear the music. From Churches, The Bones of What You Believe. One of the most sticky and likable synth-pop groups of the past decade, who many critics tried to pigeonhole as a festival buzz band before they tried to live up to some of that branding and make it a song with Marshmello that, of course, naturally became their biggest hit. Ironic that most people only seem to remember The Mother We Share off this album, despite not even being the best song on it, which proves my hypothesis that most people do not get past the first three to four songs on any church's album, and thus have never really heard the full picture here. Like Likely not the only factor as to when Lauren Mayberry repeatedly criticizes misogyny in the music industry and online, and the most stable of geniuses throw their temper tantrums. From Eminem, the Marshall Mathers LP. Two. So after Eminem discovered that a badly produced course correction and AA diatribe was not going to win him any proper Grammys, at least not for album of the year, he made a sequel that has aged just as badly and is also the only thing worth hearing from him besides Lucky You and Kill Shot in about a decade. With considerably more effort making this a proper thematic sequel than frankly anyone cared about, it's very telling that the most lasting legacy from this was not the Beastie Boys Kid Rock rollout with Berserk, but Rap God, a song that's actually aged even worse and has inspired far too many white fast rappers who think technique is better than writing actual songs and winds up the third worst fan base in hip hop. I mean, he came back, he gave you everything you wanted. So tell me, was it really worth it? From Icon for Hire, Icon for Hire. Ah yes, the other genre-bending self-referential act that deserves a ton more acclaim and attention. But because they were on tooth and nail and took some pretty transgressive positions in both their aesthetic and content, they got precisely none of it. I mean, put Icon for Hire on Fuel by Ramen, they could have been huge, at least to around 2017. I mean, I was rooting for them getting better production, pushing some further boundaries when they left that Christian label, and unfortunately, neither really happened. This band deserved to be way bigger and way better than they actually are. And this is where I would reference the other acts that Tooth and Nail pushed instead, but when the best of them might be Amberlin, is it even worth it? From the Flaming Lips, The Terror. Okay, I've got two copies of this album on vinyl, and I can't remember if I've listened to either of them in years. Now, this is because following a critically acclaimed collab album in 2012, they went on for their most anti-social record in their catalog, highlighting the world that you would experience without love. Because even for a band that can do the whole psychological nightmare fuel thing, this is what the fan base apparently wanted. Play it at Halloween to terrify the neighborhood children, it's what I do. And because the world is cruel, we don't get anything of quality from the Flaming Lips for seven goddamn years, and I'm still bitter that instead of Lipsha, we got Miley Cyrus and her dead pets. From Brandy Clark, 12 Stories. Ah yes, one of the most critically adored country albums of the 2010s, where it even actually got a bit of charting success. And naturally, Music Row decided to go in precisely the opposite direction, embracing bro country, and even if I'm fonder of that sound than most, there was room for this too. Now granted, the mature and intelligent lesbian who was writing about the actual consequences of all the petty crime and vice that erupted from that rowdier scene, she made a more, uh penetrating album than most of the bro country collected output, and that should be to the surprise of nobody. From Franz Ferdinand, right thoughts, right words, right action. The indie rock group makes their most zany and theatrical album to date, only to realize that like their spiritual peers, Sparks, the critics don't actually care that much to poke in the work and check it out. It's actually kind of ridiculous to go back now, discover that this album was co-produced by Todd Turia and Hot Chip, or how their entire brand of new wave was just years ahead of its time, or coming to the sharp realization that this is everything that Arcade Fire secretly wanted to be, but were neither cool nor legit enough to pull off. Although, I will say this album is goofy as shit. I have no idea how they got away with trees and animals, why they didn't make that a single. But hey, 
I'm not about to complain. From the Brilliancy, the Brilliancy EP. Yeah, this one stings a bit, because I know and like some members of this band who made a fantastic, well-produced, sunny power pop EP, and then suffered the commercial fate of anyone making sunny, well-produced power pop since at least the 1970s. Ironically, more people might actually know this band for covering Royals by Lord of all things, but hell, probably more will likely know their drummer as a cast member of Riverdale. I wish I was kidding. From Bill Callahan, Dream River. Bill Callahan makes very middle-aged, textured music, where if you think it would come with knee pain and rantings about cancel culture, but turns out Callahan is considerably smarter than Mark Kozlek which is not that hard. This album was wildly underappreciated and underrated outside of a certain bearded Midwestern critic set who relate way too hard to his beer, long pause, thank you line on the opening track, but they still have to pick up their kids and have their Metamucil every morning. Don't laugh too hard, you're all heading in that direction too. From Janelle Monae, The Electric Lady. The weird thing with this Janelle Monae album is that for as much as it got critical acclaim, very few critics acknowledge that it even exists even in discussing their catalog. Now some of this might be due to it being their weakest full-length album, which it is, but I think the larger indicator is that white critics love to put on some relatively accessible, high-concept albums by black women on their year-end list and then promptly forget they exist. You know, following the line of the Grammys. Kind of infuriating that the presence of a gorgeous black virtuoso who also happens to be a brilliantly eclectic nerd breaks the brains of everyone, even when they try to put out more accessible records to come. So this might be America's problem not the albums. From Daft Punk, Random Access Memories. Okay, this album has aged really weirdly because everything it was praised for in 2013 is now oddly becoming marks against it. A gloriously produced retro throwback that goes on kind of too long with features from Pharrell and Julian Casablancas. But let's be real. I think more folks are just kind of bitter that this appears to be Daft Punk's last album and that would require music nerds and a lot of music critics venture out of their comfort zone and find a fourth electronic act they actually like besides Burial, Boards of Canada, and Jamie XX. I mean, whatever. The Deceptively Silly Robots made a deceptively silly album that deserves more than your bitching than it's not Discovery 2.0. It's on you here. From Savages, Silence Yourself. God damn it, this band deserved to be more than a one album wonder. We don't really talk about Adore Light because the majority of you forgot that album exists beyond the one track that round up on Riverdale. Yes, that happened. Now, granted, noisy throwback post-punk made by radical feminists that somehow did not become turfs in the next decade almost seems too good to be true, even if 2013 had no goddamn clue what to do with them. But apparently UK still wanted something in this lane, so they've spent the last decade decade platforming the most boring post-punk imaginable while trying to sand down the edges of any act that were actually close to Savage's politics, which weren't even that radical. This is what happens when your nation is under Tory leadership for over a decade. Y'all should fix that over there. From Deep Purple, now what? This album's title's a goddamn prophecy, but let's be honest. When you have a hard rock band so many decades in, when they are on their umpteenth farewell tour and album, I literally lost count, what else are you supposed to call it? Now, granted, Deep Purple going back to their underdeveloped prog side is probably the smartest thing they could have possibly done decades after it mattered, but I think this album's presence on any year-end list is indicative of someone who is trying way too hard to assert their rock credentials for a band that most people only really know or care about for Smoke on the Water. Even the over-the-hill rock critics didn't really care about covering this. And even if they should have, who was I actually trying to impress putting this on my list? From Run the Jewels, Run the Jewels. This is the album for all the hipsters who are a little bit too spooked by the radical politics of RTJ2, which came a year later, and rap music that came the year before. The lightest, silliest, and most equipped for stoners slumped on their couches watching Rick and Morty reruns. And despite being one of the rare awesome cases where they have a song literally named after the duo and the album that it's on, this is wound up mostly overshadowed and forgotten except by a subsection of Rate Your Music who still listens to Chapo Trap House in 2020. And while it is the most cliched online music critic thing to have this as your favorite rap album of the year, I mean, it could be worse. 
could be Yeezus. From the national, Trouble Will Find Me. Ah yes, the quintessential Wine Dad album, where if you weren't depressed by the national's catalog up to this point, you sure as hell will be now. It says so many things that this is the band that can headline Pitchwork Festival and have songs from this project go off, when the majority of it is an extended cry for help that Matt Beringer would later viciously satirize on Elvi's Return to the Moon in 2015, which Pitchfork promptly hated with a passion. Although, you know what, given the excruciating history of the Cincinnati Bengals, this being their hometown band is a little bit too fitting. If slash when Joe Burrow gets bounced out of the playoffs this year, just put on humiliation. Just vibe. From Queens of the Stone Age, like clockwork. Hey look, the last time this band was remotely good, and when we actually wanted to hear from Josh Homme rivaling Adrian Peterson for Dad of the Year. The weird thing with this album is that it wound up both a lie and weirdly metatextual and prophetic at the same time. This album came years after any sort of routine release from Queens of the Stone Age in the 2000s, so it wasn't really on any clockwork regularity. But if you do want that band insufferably convinced of being hard rock statesmen with all the pomp and circumstance and guest stars around them, singing about the inevitable downfall of us all, well, they proved it with villains four years later. Just saying. From Casey Musgraves, same trailer, different park. Every insufferable hipster in country will tell you that either this or Southeastern are the best albums of 2013. And with this remaining Casey's best album years later and its gentle commentary on small town life and the broadest hints of progressive values, I mean, you think it would have done more at the time. And then you remember bro country stampeding over everything and cowardly little dipshits like Bobby Bones on Nashville radio deciding that instead of Casey Musgraves' chill vibes and mountains of critical acclaim, they wanted her label mate Sam Hunt instead. Casey would then go on to win a bunch of Grammys by ignoring them all entirely, promising an emo country album that we never got where her ex-husband would deliver instead, twice, and then getting really goddamn high. That probably explains all the production on Starcrossed. From Arion, The Theory of Everything. Hey look, the progressive metal super genius Arian Lucasen comes back after five years with a tangled stage musical exploring neurodivergence, mental health, genius, experimental drugs, and daddy issues on an album that would almost certainly get him cancelled in 2023. Can't imagine why it made my list or something. Like The Human Equation, it received a ton of critical acclaim provided you didn't pay too close attention to the science, or the gender dynamics, or any coherent plot in the larger Arion universe, which I think at this point, given all the time travel, you need a medium-sized flow chart to explain the continuity. But Arian would later follow this up by writing himself into deeper holes. I mean, I get it. He is wont to do that. And finally, from Nick Cave and the Bad Seas, push the sky away. Ah yes, where Nick Cave gets over his midlife crisis and Mick Harvey leaving the band with a lot of vague existential confusion paired with some of the strangest lyrics you will hear on any record in 2013. Songs about mermaids and brothels having a fetus on a leash, calling Wikipedia heaven, and multiple references to Miley Cyrus in both a swimming pool and an African savanna on a song about the collapse of religion in the face of the Higgs boson particle. Oh, to be that lucky. In its wake, Nick Cave would suffer horrendous tragedy, make soul-crushingly sad music about it, and then win back every critic he lost in the 2000s, but this ultimately remains a sprawling existential nightmare which way too many people considered far too boring and confusing. Naturally, it's my favorite album of the year. Go figure. <laughs>